a trio is is meant to go all right each tree becomes an island and because in a trio we have three different trees so it could be two fruit trees and a nitrogen fixing tree it could be a fruit tree and a nut shrub and a nitrogen fixing tree or shrub it could be two nuts and a nitrogen fixer They're, the combinations vary depending where you are depending what grows best and i always say you know there's nothing that beats easy so grow whatever grows like a weed you're listening to the food garden life show the show that brings together gardening food and the human story i'm your host emma biggs and i'm stephen biggs we talk to creative food gardeners and farm and garden experts who break the rules and make new ones, too. A trio of trees. It's one of the ideas we hear about today as we visit an orchard. An orchard that doesn't look like an orchard. So stay tuned if you want to grow fruit trees at home, if you're interested in edible landscapes, or if you're interested in food forests. Our guest is orchardist Stefan Subkoviak, and he's got a neat background that weaves together biology and landscape design. Stefan ran a traditional organic orchard for a number of years. It was a monoculture of apple trees. But then he ripped it out and created a new orchard based on permaculture principles. For those of you curious about what permaculture is, I'll let Stefan give you the details, but in short, think of a circular ecosystem with minimal external inputs. Stefan's orchard is called Miracle Farms, and you can find out more at the website, which is miracle.farm. You can also see the orchard and get more of Stefan's advice on his YouTube channel. Just search by his name. First name, Stefan, S-T-E-F-A-N. Last name, Subkoviak, S-O-B-K-O-W-I-A-K. Today's interview is from our April 5th live show. Now, let's head to Quebec and chat with Stefan. Stefan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Stephen. We're really happy to have you here. And um, maybe just to start with, can you tell our listeners in just a couple sentences, what you say to people who want to understand what is permaculture? Well, it's just uh, I, my favorite definition that I use because <laughs> I think, you know, you could get complicated about it. It's just applied common sense. So anytime you think, well, that makes a lot of sense, guaranteed that in that makes sense, there are one or more of the permaculture principles applied. So that's kind of how I define it. It's there's ethics and principles involved, but if it makes a lot of sense, uh, it really is something that's touching on it. I really love that applied common sense. That's great. Tell us about your permaculture orchard. How many acres is it, and what what does it look like? It started off as a four thousand tree monoculture apple orchard that got I transitioned it to organic. So we were a fairly large organic uh, orchard and we ended up after about 12 years we ripped up almost all of it and started over again something i don't recommend people do don't start over just get another piece of property and and start a permaculture orchard instead because if you have an orchard and it's going and it's especially if it's profitable keep it going but it's it's simply an orchard that's really the opposite of monoculture. The monoculture you had mentioned before, it's mono, so one crop grown. And permaculture is is many. So it's a polyculture. There will be many types of trees, many types of fruit trees, uh, many types of not fruit bearing trees as well. So it's a mix. It's it's meant to sim, simulate or copy the ideas of what's going on in a forest or a forest edge is more precise because it's it's not a closed canopy system. We use rows and so there is space between the rows. So it's more like the edge of a forest with the diversity in trees and shrubs and perennials and vines, uh, your your vertical veg camp. Uh, you really touch on it. I I think people highly underestimate the vertical 
if you're growing in a small space, you don't have a lot, go go vertical. Really, it, you discover a hole. All of a sudden, you go, wow, I didn't think I had the space. But you do have the space if you're using your wall, if you're using a fence, uh, if you're using trees to grow plants up. So that's that's all possible. And that's kind of what to imagine. Imagine an orchard, but that doesn't look like an orchard. Really interesting. So I love this analogy of the the forest edge and recreating some of that diversity and using the vertical as much as possible. Um, One other thing, uh, when I was watching some of your online videos, you have something that really struck me and you talk about having a system of trios. And I wonder if you could explain that to our listeners. Yeah, trios, it's... So that's the basic design unit, as opposed to monoculture, which would be you go by one tree. So you have one tree, it could be a honeycrisp apple. Well, you won't have one honeycrisp apple, you'll have a whole row of them. And you can actually end up usually having many rows of rows. So you'll have hundreds or thousands of the same exact tree. So trios breaks that pattern because when i had a monoculture organic orchard i realized the problem was when you do have insects and you you will when an insect comes around there is nothing to break its advance so imagine these trees in a row are touching each other usually if an insect likes this exact tree well there's nothing for it to just go to the next one and the next one and the next one and I've seen that. I mean, I've lived through it and I know what, what that does. Now, a trio is is meant to go, all right, each tree becomes an island. And because in a trio, we have three different trees. So it could be two fruit trees and a nitrogen fixing tree. It could be a fruit tree and a nut shrub and a nitrogen fixing tree or shrub. It could be two nuts and a nitrogen fixer. The combinations vary depending where you are, depending what grows best. And I always say, you know, there's nothing that beats easy. So grow whatever grows like a weed. And that's that's the trio system. So it would be, let's say, an apple, a sea berry, and a pear tree. Okay, so now you have a trio. And then you repeat the trio. You can have, again, an apple, a sea berry, and another pear. So you'd have two different kinds of pears. Already you're getting a diversity and you can have two different kinds of apples and you mm. could put two different nitrogen fixing plants if you like. And so that's that's the basis of a trio. You have better pollination in the fruit. You have you really cut that monoculture march for insects because once they're caught on an apple tree and they go, oh, sea berry, what's that? I don't go in there. All the predators live in there. I don't go into that. And so that's where you get a, you start to work with nature just by the very design of the orchard. And that's where it really gets interesting because what I had as my worst problem when I had a monoculture organic orchard was caterpillars. And I seen what the march of a caterpillar, like not a caterpillar, I'm talking thousands and even tens of thousands of them marching through the orchard can do. Well, when that was my worst problem, and now the orchard having changed, I get excited to see caterpillars. Like that is not a pro- it's so much not an issue. I really do get excited. It's like, oh, we got some caterpillars. Huh. I just wonder who's going to eat them all or what's going to get rid of them. So that's a big, big change when you start to work with nature instead of against and so I'm picturing these trios now in a row, and it sounds like it's not a repetition of the same trio up a given row, but you can mix different trios then as you go up and down a row. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it just it, it really comes down to what do you want in the end? If you say, I really like apples and cherries, so use apples and cherries. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It, if you're going commercial, well, what would your clients want? What would your customers like to pick? And so that's really what you're doing and taking advantage of using what grows really well on the site. And mm-hmm. part of the trio, that's the tree trio. And then there is also a vertical trio. So we do use the vertical aspect right in the design of the orchard. So if you have a tree, 
you usually have a space underneath the tree. So we put a couple of fruit bearing shrubs right under the tree, one on each side of the tree. And then we add at least 10 perennials. So these could be flowers, it could be herbs, it could be perennial vegetables. So these are plants that will now fill the space under the tree where in a commercial orchard, that space is usually occupied by herbicide and killing all the grass out. Like mm -hmm. that's literally what that space is used in a commercial non-organic orchard. So we're filling that space with plants that are really beneficial to the fruit and that are beneficial for you because now you don't have a space you have to kill things in. You have a space that actually give you some crop. Very interesting. And as you're describing that, I'm picturing some of the commercial orchards not far from us here in, in Niagara, where you see just that, where there's been the herbicide applied underneath and it's just bare earth. So it's really a sterile environment compared to what you've described with the flowers, the herbs, the fruiting bushes underneath those trees. Exactly. So it really, it. I mean, I use it in a commercial setting, but it I find in a backyard, in a small orchard setting, it even works better because you're not stuck with, well, if I have a fruit tree, I got to put something, some herbicide under. And so you really use that space so you can have your fruit trees and you can have the beauty element and you can have the attractiveness to beneficial insects if you want. And you can have the attractiveness to birds if that's what you want. Whatever you want, you can integrate fruit trees given at least that you have enough sunshine for fruit trees, because mm -hmm. that is that can be a concern in some urban environments where you have tall buildings, you may not have enough sun, but then go and use the vertical. You can grow other things. You can still have fruit. You could have kiwi. Kiwi love to be in partial shade. You can have grapes. You can have, you know, climbing vegetables. Absolutely. Do you dislike wasps? I know I'm never happy when they show up on my patio while I'm out there eating. But Stefan loves it when they show up in the orchard. And coming up, he explains why. That's coming up in just a moment. We've got some shout outs today. And I would have shouted out some of these last week, except that for the first time in a long time, we missed a week. Sorry about that, but it's tax season. Thanks to Jody, who sent us Easter wishes. And thanks to Jane, who's enjoying the podcasts on realityradio101.com. And to Dan, really glad you enjoyed that show about the American chestnut. And, and thanks, Dan, for always cheering us on. Thanks to all of you for being part of our food gardening gang. We're always adding new articles to the foodgardenlife.com website, and this week we've got a new piece about ground cherries and Cape gooseberries. If you're looking for an easy-to-grow annual fruit crop, these are favorites of ours. We put them in the veggie patch, and we grow them in containers, so find those at foodgardenlife.com. And I have a special offer for podcast listeners. I'd love to meet you. So along with my Edible Garden Makeover Master Class, I've included a May 9th live edible gardening event. For anybody who signs up for Edible Garden Makeover Master Class, there's a free talk on May 9th and you get $20 off. By the way, Edible Garden Makeover is a self-paced online class and it's really my love letter to the edible garden with all my favorite tips, techniques, and crops. You can find it at foodgardenlife.com and remember you get a free spot at the May 9th live event and you save $20 when you sign up before April 30th. Now to get that, to get the savings and, and get to the free event, just use this coupon code EDIBLEGARDEN. So again that coupon code is EDIBLEGARDEN. And one last announcement for this week, for those of you in Toronto, Toronto Urban Growers which is a really cool group, urban agriculture group here in Toronto, they're doing a screening of the movie Kiss the Ground. This is a fundraiser for this amazing group. And if you're interested, Kiss the Ground screening, 
the website to go to is kisstheground.eventbrite.ca. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show, the show that brings together gardening, food, and the human story with your hosts, Emma Biggs and me, Stephen Biggs. Now, back to our chat with Stefan Subkoviak. This is great. So we're talking about the vertical. We've talked about the trios. And are there other design concepts that we should be thinking about as we're thinking about permaculture and growing fruit? Yeah, it's it's a question of uh, getting nature to work for you. I mean, working with the existing system. So part of, I consider part of the design of putting in a permaculture orchard is putting in anything you can that will attract, I call them allies. It's elements of nature that will actually help uh, help you grow fruit trees in a much easier way. So it could be something as simple as putting up nest boxes for birds. It could be putting up some bee hotels. Uh, we put nest boxes for bumblebees and for wasps. I know a lot of people, oh my God, he's talking about wasps. Wasps are terrible. No, wasps are actually the most useful insect you can have if you're growing fruit because they are, in the summertime, they are by far the best uh, caterpillar predator out there. So having a wasp nest, I can guarantee that you're going to see a huge decrease in all kinds of caterpillars. Uh, so these are things you could put in a bird bath. You could put in a little feeder. Anything that you're going to do that will attract birds, insects to your surroundings, that adds to the diversity. And that diversity creates stability and it allows you to grow your fruit much more easily. A, a couple emails in, and uh, thanks to Catherine in Florida, who's enjoying the show and, and putting the pressure on me to build Emma that greenhouse. And a question from Pam, and Pam's asking Stefan about uh, whether you have visitors to the two Miracle Farms. Yeah, we uh, usually have a spring and a fall tour. I haven't put up the uh, the registration for the tour yet, but we have a spring blossom tour and it's on May 20th. And then we have a harvest tour, which is the middle Saturday. I think it's the 16th of September. Uh, so yeah, we do have, we have a, a French tour. And then in the afternoon, we have an English tour. We get people from, like I tell, that's where we've gone and we put together a virtual tour because we were having people travel here uh, all the way from Europe just to visit. And I said, no, that's really not the purpose of having this orchard. It's it's to allow people to learn, but that you don't have to travel so far. So if if you're within, I'd say even Toronto, we always have somebody from around Toronto. Uh, if you're that far or if you're further, consider doing a, a virtual tour. There is, uh, you could find that at miracle.farm. And it's just, it gives you the same context. It gives you more content because usually with questions, uh, there's only so much you can cover in about two and a half hours. But yes, we do have a tour. Okay, that's good. I'm glad you mentioned that virtual tour. So at miracle.farm. And, and we should also just mention again your YouTube channel because you're putting out a lot of really detailed, useful videos there. So uh, Stefan has a, a fabulous YouTube channel too. Thank you. You mentioned how when you first got your orchard, it was an existing orchard, and you made the comment that in hindsight, maybe you could have just started over rather than trying to modify this orchard. Let's talk about that a little bit, the the idea of trying to modify an existing orchard versus starting fresh. I would always recommend starting fresh and having done both. It's far easier to just start from scratch start with a bare piece of land or start with something that's not treed already helps a lot. If you have an existing orchard, I would say it depends on the condition. You almost want an orchard that's degraded in that there's a lot of trees missing because then it makes it easier. If you do what I had, let's say, complete blocks of trees, uh, there's not much you could do 
you almost have to pull out two out of the three trees just to get a, a decent trio working. I mm. took out three out of three trees and I learned a couple of years after I really didn't need to do that. I could have overgrafted. And that is an option. You can, if you have apples, well, you can overgraft, you can keep the apples. But if you don't want that kind, because a lot of commercial uh, apple cultivars are really quite susceptible to disease and it doesn't make for a very easy orchard. So you could overgraft to disease resistant cultivars and that can be an option. I tell people, look, if you have the misfortune of inheriting or buying a monoculture orchard, and I do say the misfortune, uh, think of doing it in an organic way by keeping sheep under the trees. It, it is from all the ways I tried in 15 years, it was the easiest approach because the sheep rotated in the orchard. And I'm not saying put sheep in and they have access to the whole orchard. They have to be moved. There is some work and management involved. But if sheep are moved through the orchard, the grass never looked better. Uh, the fertility cycled very well because grass becomes manure, becomes food for the trees. The apples that fall become food for the sheep, become an end of the insect cycles. And so, yes, the, the sheep will eat the bottom of the trees. They'll eat all the leaves up to chest height, but you will have far better aeration. It, it's the easiest I found to do if you had a monoculture. I wouldn't go back to it. I did like having sheep. We had 100 sheep on our farm, which was just 12 acres. That was pushing it, but it gave some incredibly good results. Like we were looking for insect pests and we couldn't even find them. That's how good a control they do, because you'll never find every apple that falls, but the sheep would. Well, I think the sheep might be part of the answer to my next question, which is just talking about ways that we can minimize external inputs. Uh, can you talk to that point? Yeah, the the easiest is start with the ch choosing uh, disease resistant cultivars. And there are some for every fruit. You do a little searching, start with uh, disease resistance. So there is resistance that's naturally occurring in Apples, for example, they're called, usually they're scab free, but they're also other disease free. So they'll, they'll be resistant to ap cedar apple rust, resistant to whatever the diseases that are out there, mostly scab, apple scab. And that already starts off giving you a tree that is much easier. So you don't have to deal with any fungicide sprays or any organic uh, disease control sprays. So just doing that you'll already see, wow, this is so much easier. Uh, just mm -hmm. to give you an example, our commercial orchard, when we started as organic, the most resistant cultivars we had, we had none that were completely disease resistant, but resistance is a question of degrees. So some were not very susceptible. So those uh, that were not very susceptible now, compared to the new ones that I brought in, those have gone from being the best to being the worst in the orchard. Wow. So there's really a question of degrees. Start with what's already proven to be easy. Uh, if you're growing cherries, for example, go with a, if you say you're, you only have room for one cherry tree, well, then make sure that it is self-fertile. So something like in cherry, you could get Stella sweet cherry. If you're looking at plums, you could get Mount Royal Plum, which is a self-fertile. Otherwise, you will have to have two trios. You have to have two of the same fruit just to guarantee you have a better chance of getting pollination. Mm. And that then there's, yeah. So starting with that is, is a great way. Using mulch, using other plants underneath. So if you're going to grow flowers and things, put shredded leaves under, put wood chip mulch under. Uh, it's all things to really help the tree. A tree that's in totally vibrant health is actually repelling insect pests. And it can, you can get there. You have to have an abundance of organic matter and you have to have an abundance of minerals and minerals in the, in the sense of rock dusts. 
If you mix those two together, it's like giving the tree a huge bank account to draw from in the years to come. And I find usually every four years is good to renew that bank account. But one treatment for four years is a great way to reduce the necessary external inputs. I love that analogy of the bank account with the uh, the minerals and the organic matter. That's such a nice way to describe that. I, I wanted to ask about uh, timeline, Stefan. So uh, people hearing what you're talking about, uh, feeling excited about trying this. Now, how if you were to set out, say, this spring and, and start planting, what kind of timelines would one be looking at before harvesting? It really is a function of the size of the tree. So if you're going in a dwarf tree, if you can grow dwarf trees in your climate, Dwarf just take less time to reach mature bearing age, but on the other hand, they're not as long lived. If you go with mm. a standard, which is a full size tree, in the case of apple, for example, you can get a a twelve foot dwarf tree. That's it's going to be its maximum height. It'll be twelve feet, and and that's it. Some of them can be ultra dwarf, and you get something that's say eight feet high. You can reach everything, even the top. Well, that's great. If you go to a standard size. Now your tree could be 30 feet high, but it'll live 100, it could live 150 years. So it kind of just depends. Are you doing this for yourself for a project or are you doing this as a legacy? So those are questions to answer. The difference being a dwarf can bear its first fruits usually in its third year, mm. uh, as opposed to a standard tree, which you could wait six, seven, eight years before it'll produce its first flowering and its first crop. So it, it, it really comes down, it depends. I would say if you have a little bit of space, put in a mix, put in a few dwarfs so you'll get some quicker results, but put in some standards so you'll have long-term. Uh, it can be a beautiful tree if you did a little bit of training instead of pruning especially, and that's a whole different issue. But that could really make a nice legacy to leave. I love that. I love that idea of uh, having legacy as well as harvest for for yourself quickly. That's a nice combination. A question has come in from uh, Tina, who's just asking whether you're selling produce year round. So you've got all these different things growing in the orchard. It, are you harvesting year round? How does that work? Uh, we're in a climate where we really have very seasonally. We harvest from, our fruit is harvested from July right through to the end or thereabouts end of October. So that's our fruiting season. We usually, we try to sell everything in season. We only really store for ourselves. We don't look to store to then sell throughout the season. Uh, but certainly you could, and it, you know, if we wanted to get into that whole thing of storing, packing, and then selling, that's that's certainly a possibility. But uh, we don't. We just, it's during the season. All our customers have to be members. We don't even function as a uh, an open farm. Although we are open to pick, it's a you pick, but it's a members only you pick, and we do that really to control uh, how many people we can allow. Okay, excellent. And and Stefan, as we uh, get to, towards the end here, I just want to make sure that we we talk about the film. And also, you've got a, a wonderful online pruning course. Start off with the film. Tell us about that. Yeah, the film was really the first public thing that we did. So it's you could get it at the permacultureorchard.com. It's meant to be a two-hour really condensed course. And I'm amazed how many people have started their orchards with just that. Like it's it's condensed. There is not as far and wide a, a, an information source, but it can get you started. And so that is like, I think it's $10 for a online version. And like, just if you're interested in this, just get that because it can get you started. Uh, it's yeah, it was done really. It, I, everything I do, I do it partly selfishly. It's the things that I would have loved to have had when I started, and it would have saved me years, literally years of effort and trial and error. So I get you to the 
you know, you're out the out the gate and going at 50 miles an hour much quicker than if you started and you're just learning all this as you go on your own. And I believe you have a course as well. Is that right? Yeah, we have a few of them. That's starting one, we started with the pruning course. So that's mm -hmm. pruningcourse.com. Because I realized pruning is something that people really what's in the what's in the books and what's out there is so outdated, unfortunately, compared to what is the actual current information for commercial orchardists. So I really try to bridge that gap with it. And it really brings the best information out there in pruning. Uh, so you could watch the first one for free. Just It's really worth it. If you're not sure about pruning, and even if you think you know about pruning, it shows you that really you could do a lot without pruning. It's, people think you have to prune. You have to train your tree, but you don't have to prune your tree. I guess as we wrap up, just quickly tell people where to find you on YouTube, because I think people will also love that. Stefan, S-T-E-F-A-N, Sobkowiak, S-O-B-K-O-W-I-A-K, uh, the Permaculture Orchard. So that's the channel. Welcome to join. There's, uh, I think there's over 250 videos, a lot there. And you can really, I've, how many people say, wow, I think I've seen all your videos. There is a lot to learn. And we've continued that now with the master class at permaculture.study. And I mean, this is this is my life's work kind of in there. We put everything I know about it in that course. Uh, but you can certainly get an awful lot just from YouTube. And, and I have to, to say your YouTube videos are really fun. There's a lot of dry stuff out there, but they're so fun as well as informative, Stefan. Well, you always learn better when you've got a smile and you're laughing. So that's the idea. Mm, I love it. Thank you very much for joining us today. Fascinating to learn all about your permaculture orchard. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen. And keep keep with the vertical. It's on, on uncharted waters often. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye now. Bye. That was our chat with Stefan Subkoviak from Miracle Farms, and you can find him online at miracle.farm. What did you think? I really like Stefan's short and sweet definition of permaculture, saying it's just applied common sense. I was also interested in the idea of a system of trios with fruit shrubs and perennials underneath. And as Stefan was talking about that in his orchard, I was thinking, oh, this is such a perfect fit for home gardens and for food forests as well. As we wrap up today's episode, I'm thinking about an apple orchard I recently saw here in southern Ontario. The field was big, I don't know, about 50 acres, and it was row after row after row of tightly spaced dwarf apple trees growing along wires. High density, high input, and truly the antithesis of what Stefan is doing. The podcast is back next Thursday, and if you like equipment, tune in. Even if you don't like equipment, and you want to get away from the rototiller mindset, I think you'll be very interested. We check in with edible ecosystem designer and grower, Zach Lokes, and we'll hear about the two-wheel tractor. We'd love it if you drop by to say hi online at foodgardenlife.com. We have articles about growing fruit, veg, using your homegrown produce, also about growing figs and lemons in cold climates. So say hi. Tell us the topics that would help you grow more of your own. And you'll also get to see the faces that go with these voices that you hear on the podcast. While you're at foodgardenlife.com, also grab our free newsletter. Subscribers get the subscriber-only cold climate fig guide and small space food gardening tip sheet. And you can find me on my website, emmabiggs.ca, and on Instagram as emmabiggs underscore grows. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show. I'm Stephen Biggs. And I'm Emma Biggs. Thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.